Outlook uh, webinar. Um, this is going to be uh, with me today. <clears throat> excuse me. With me today is uh, is Jacob Wilby, my uh, my partner in crime and in, uh, in research here at Red Cloud. Um, and you know, we've started that we're starting with this 2020 Outlook webinar, but this is going to be the first in a, a series of webinars that we're going to do. Uh, over the course of 2020. Uh, and basically, it's going to be every Thursday at 2 o'clock. And some days we'll talk about companies. Some weeks we'll talk about companies. And other weeks we'll talk about um, uh, uh, topics that are affecting the affecting the mining space. So um, tune in this, uh, this Thursday at 2 p.m. for our Silver Viper webinar. Uh, but for today, uh, we'll be talking about our outlook. So um, to get started, uh, Jacob's going to take care of the disclosures. Okay, so... Uh, please see the full disclaimer and disclosures on our website, and I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Uh, we have entire list of our coverage uh, with each disclosure broken down on slide one of this presentation. Uh, I'd ask that uh, you refer to it at your leisure. And with that, uh, we can begin. So we'll be on page six, is it? Six. Yeah, so uh, Josh has uh, put up a link to our, uh, to our full presentation. Uh, the first couple slides are just our top picks at our coverage universe. And, and just as a reminder, uh, as this webinar goes on, uh, feel free to, to put in your questions on any, any names on those, those two lists. Uh, we're happy to talk about them or, or comment on our view and what we know about them. Um, starting off, and starting off really simply, our, uh, our outlook for 2020, there's a few key themes that, that we see uh, coming. Um, you know, one of, the, one of them is that gold is back. Now, not just because we're mining analysts that we, that we like gold, um, there are a lot of macro factors that are lining up, including uh, negative or negative yielding real and nominal debt, along with uh, obviously money flowing into the space. We've seen a, an uptick in uh, in GLD in inventories and physical gold ETF. So those are both positives positives for the face for the space. The second uh, second key theme is that gold M and A is back. Um, I think we've seen a lot of transactions, particularly even in Q4, uh, with the majors sort of getting to the end of their divestiture cycle post the mega mergers from earlier in 2019. And the Aussies being very active and trying to acquire uh, acquire assets. And the third is that is PGM, so platinum, palladium, and rhodium uh, all I think are going to be strong this year. Um, particularly, uh, we continue to like palladium, and obviously, there's limited ways to uh, to play that uh, that particular space. Okay, on to copper. Um, obviously, uh, we have a tightening copper market. Uh, as far as supply and demand goes, but uh, the Sino-American trade resolution to the to the trade war is really what we need. It seems to be in sight. Um, as I was mentioning, supply deficits are forecast for the next three to five years, pretty much from any of the major uh, forecasters that we follow. Um, zinc has a, a decent supply and demand scenario right now, but it's going to take a backseat to copper um, and, and the trade resolution. It should and most likely would follow copper's lead, um, and that's uh, the way we see uh, copper and zinc unfolding. Uh, nickel was a big topic uh, for last year, um, mostly because of um, EVs, and that's what something we expect to continue for this year. The fundamentals for nickel are really, really strong. The problem is that there's very few ways to invest in, in sort of pure play nickel, uh, which is, uh, you know, kind of ironic because in Canada, we were known for so long as the country that produced all this nickel and we had various different nickel companies. Uh, that's unfortunately not the case right now. And the, the big paradigm shift there is that, you know, we're, we're going from about, you know, 3% of global nickel being used in EVs last year to potentially as high as 15% or more by the end of this decade. So that's a five-fold increase. There's no other base metal or, or hardly any metal at all that is going to see that kind of a market change over this decade. So um, maybe not this year, but certainly in the near to longer term, nickel is going to be a very big deal. Um, 
As far as battery metals, uh, you know, they had their run and they're kind of in the doghouse for now. I mean, lithium hit a new four year low price uh, just yesterday. Uh, and uh, some of the graphite stocks have not done so well. Right. We're not going to name any names there, but I think you guys uh, are probably well aware of some of those. So the luster or the shine from the battery, the battery metals uh, outside of nickel and cobalt uh, have, have certainly come off. Cobalt, we think, is, is probably bottomed, but you have to be careful in cobalt because the supply response can be quick and substantial coming out of uh, the African copper belt. Onto uranium. Uranium, yeah. So uh, uranium has been a, an unloved commodity for a while, um, and we've, we've we've written a lot about it uh, over the last year and a bit. And I think our view is that 2020 is the year. Um, there's a long there's a long buying cycle for uranium, uh, and right now it looks like if you look look a little deeper at the uranium inventories that are out there, it's about two years supply for utilities. The cycle to purchase uranium from a long term contract being signed to it showing up at the door is about two years, and so um, utilities are going to have to come back to the table. And then obviously you have the, on the supply side, you have the producers, the major producers, both Kazataprom and Cameco, sort of demanding higher prices before they enter into to, to long-term contracts. And so um, we think that this is the year that that is gonna have to start to change. Um, obviously there's a number of, of sort of uh, geopolitical and macro events that could push it in that direction. But in, in reality, the, the, the supply demand fundamentals are gonna push, uh, should push uranium higher uh, this year. And then, on to discoveries. One of the things, you know, we've talked a lot about individual commodities and what's going on, but, you know, the drill bit continues to be the, the biggest creator of value in the mining space. Um, one good drill hole can double a company uh, instantly. We saw that. There's an example of that today. Um, and so I think the I think that this is something that to watch for. And on those, you know, those, those 10 to 20 million dollar market cap companies that are that are hard at work, uh, drilling can uh, suddenly change their fortunes in a big hurry. And then on to uh, rare earths. Rare earths have been uh, topical, uh, in the, especially in the second mm -hmm. half of last year. Uh, the biggest change uh, we think we saw in that, in that market is the United States Army announcing uh, their first investment in uh, the business world since the Manhattan Project. Um, and this bodes extremely well for rare earth, explore, rare earth explorers, especially those in Canada, the U.S. and, and Australia. Uh, we'll talk more about this uh, investment by the U.S. Army uh, a little bit later. Uh, but, um, you know, we've seen in the past when rare earths became uh, in fashion, a lot of the explorers' stocks just went completely vertical and uh, stayed there for a while, but then came back down to earth fairly quickly. So you have to be nimble if you're going to play that market. Sure. Just on to the next slide there, Josh. Um, so de delving a little more into precious metals, touched on this briefly on, on, on the first slide. Obviously, we think the, go the gold bull market is back. Um, I think uh, what is one of the things that uh, we didn't talk about, though, is the geopolitical factors. Obviously, with uh, the situation in Iran and a few other things, you know, while the fundamentals for gold, the macroeconomic fundamentals are good for gold, I think that, you know, a geopolitical catalyst could push it higher, um, although those have been uh, short term uh, events recently. Uh, the second, and I think there's two important important stats here. You've got um, the, the investors and m and continuing almost $10 billion uh, in, in Q4. Uh, Aussie's putting $3 billion to work uh, in buying assets and, and primarily uh, chasing assets outside of, uh, outside of Australia uh, from our perspective. And so that's another uh, opportunity. So I think m and is poised to move uh, down cap. I think you're going to see large scale developers or junior producers sort of be the next uh, set of targets. PGM, I, you know, obviously, platinum and palladium have been very hot. They're very hot in 2019. There's nothing that's actually structurally changed in the market to stop the uh, the increase in price. Um, both markets are in, are in deficit, and so we expect both to continue to move up. Um, and you know, on PGMs, uh, we can get into it if anyone, someone wants to learn more. But you know, substitution is not a risk for uh, in the near term. I guess uh, maybe in the in the medium term it is. Second, uh, and I guess lastly, and this is this is something that is. Uh, that, that uh, it, it's not going to be different this time for silver. Um, silver gold ratio is 86 times, it's historically 67. I'm not going to say that it's going to go back to 67, but it, in, a, in a gold bull market, the ratio compresses. And so um, silver names continue to be a leverage play on gold. And, and just as, uh, as operations, silver plays are, uh, are levered as well. So any move in the silver price, and then you're going to get a, a big run in the silver equities as well. So 
looking at our uh, our top picks of the precious metal side um, versus RNC Minerals. Uh, basically, our view on RNC is that there's been an operational turnaround there. There's a company that added $12 million in cash to its balance sheet uh, in Q4, um, a far cry from where it was uh, even a, even six months ago. And so I think this is uh, th and this turnaround isn't yet priced in the stock trades about half the, the valuation multiple of its peer group. And so there's lots of opportunity there with Seabridge. It's a slightly different investment thesis. Uh, there's one is that Seabridge is a good levered gold play. So in a rising gold price environment, it tends to outperform the gold price. The second part of it, though, is that there is, you know, management is working hard on a JV to do a JV on their major asset KSM. They need a partner to, to go build it. Um, and we think that the stock could almost double. Uh, it could double on the day that that JV is announced. So that is a huge catalyst that's coming uh, for that uh, for that stock. On uh, on, on Wallbridge, which Jace covers, uh, obviously they've got lots of uh, lots of drill news, drilling news that's coming. Almost twenty five thousand meters plus a, in the can, plus a hundred thousand meters that's yet to come from this year. Uh, and obviously uh, with Kirkland Lake's investment at the end of last year, the stock started to get very interesting. Uh, with respect to uh, Mawson, this is a uh, a, a funded uh, explorer in Finland, one of our favorite jurisdictions, and uh, they're actively drilling. We think that they their their resource is currently around five hundred thousand ounces. We think that they've drilled enough uh, in their last program to be close to a million, just not forty three one hundred one yet, and they have the potential to be a million and a half to two million. So, looking forward to their success and with five drills turning up, that the stock that could move in the very near term. And then lastly is Group Ten. Uh, it is a a platinum group metals explorer. Uh, it's in the Stillwater camp. It's a J right next to uh, Still the Stillwater mine. Uh, it's owned by Sabanye. Uh, I think that there's a uh, it's prime for a re rating. So you get the re rating on uh, on X on um, the PGM side, and also uh, they're continuing to drill. So there's a potential for exploration success there as well. Uh, over to Jake on base metals. So obviously the theme for everybody on on base metals is going to be really waiting on a trade resolution. Um, and Derek and I have been doing some marketing meetings around New York and, and Toronto recently, and we'll be continuing to do so uh, the rest of this week. And we're finding very little investor demand in the base metal sector. Uh, starting with nickel, uh, we touched on the EV demand earlier. Uh, the other things that were impactful in the nickel market last year were the uh, nickel ore export ban in Indonesia that got moved up by a full two years. Uh, so that caught the market a little bit off guard. And also they, in the Philippines, they put a moratorium on new nickel laterite mining because of some uh, well-publicized uh, landslides that occur. Um, those are two places that are big swing producers in the nickel market. And when you cap them, you greatly reduce the ability for the market to respond to higher prices. And we've seen nickel inventories really start to dwindle down. Um, and as I mentioned before, nickel is currently very underserved in the Canadian market. There are a number of Australian nickel companies. Um, some of them do quite well. Um, and there are some new ones coming to market in Canada. Uh, an example is a company called Canada Nip Nickel Company. Uh, another one coming is called Sudbury Platinum. Uh, those will be coming out shortly, and uh, we really expect a lot of that kind of uh, new issuance to continue in 2020. Uh, back to copper. Um, you know, we really think that it, it's poised for a comeback here. We, we've seen uh, an uptick in prices. Uh, we hit sort of a four or five month high yesterday and then peeled back a little bit from it. And you hear more and more sort of longer term value thinkers talking about, you know, investing in copper. We had a little bit of, of interest uh, from our, our marketing meetings. Um, the big thing is that, uh, you know, the deficits are here and they're here for good trade resolution or not. Uh, on the mine side, crew is forecasting deficits for this year all the way to 2023. And I've seen other agencies talking about deficits perhaps all the way to 2025. So if you follow the space, you, you probably know about uh, First Quantum's Cobra de Panama, huge mine that is uh, ramped up and, you know, really doing quite well for the size of it. Uh, things to come on in the future, uh, the Chukicamata uh, underground, 
Uh, of course, Grassberg, which is Freeport's huge mine in Indonesia, uh, starts additional block caving. Um, and the grade in the copper side is really expected to start increasing uh, this quarter. Last year, there was a big, uh, a big difference in their copper production as they were transitioning from open pit to fully underground. So the open pit is no longer being mined. They're, they're full block cave underground now at Grassberg. Uh, and that was a big dent in the copper supply this year. Uh, the spent sulfides will come on as well this year. There's a, a Chinese project called Yulong Phase 2 uh, and uh, Kulong in 2021. Keovaco is a huge copper opportunity that uh, um, Anglo-American is building. Um, it's very, very big investment, very big earth moving uh, project. It'll start to come on in 2022. Uh, then we're gonna also gonna see uh, QB2 or Quebrada Blanca 2, which is tech's uh, growth project in Chile. Uh, around that time, we'll start to see Camoa, uh, the uh, Ivanhoe new discovery in, in the DRC, which is truly phenomenal as a deposit. And post that, we get towards 2023 when we get the El Teniente, which uh, is the lieutenant, um, the new mine level project of Cadelco's at El Teniente. That project has already been delayed by five years. Uh, so that, you know, demonstrates how we have ended up with these these deficits is that you know in, in years past when there wasn't money or demand for a lot of copper uh, these things just got delayed year over year over year and then into 2024 that's when OU Tolgoy's underground grade really starts to pick up and it becomes a more major producer okay so that's your copper horizon but there's nothing really huge there that's really market crushing at all um, the overprint of the, the China-U.S. trade war, you know, as we said, we, we're expecting it to, uh, to be reduced at the very least and potentially end this year, which is something we absolutely need for base metals uh, and for, to get investors interested in base metals. Uh, zinc, as we mentioned, continues to have decent supply fundamentals. This part of the market is being totally ignored. Um, so longer term thinking companies or perhaps private equity firms uh, could be likely to start snapping up some of these projects. I, I spoke with uh, one of my best contacts in the zinc world um, who's been in the industry much longer than I have. And uh, he really had relayed that the sentiment in zinc is, is as poor as he's ever seen it. Um, he was at the LME week uh, this past year and uh, it was just real doom and gloom amongst the zinc guys. Um, the thing about zinc to be aware of is that there is an oversupply of zinc concentrate, but a lot of this concentrate is of poor quality. So you still can get funding for better quality zinc concentrate, especially higher grade zinc concentrate, because the smelters need to work through that lower quality concentrate. They can blend the high grade stuff with it. So they need the high grade even more than they did in the past. So on to our top picks in the base metal space. Um, in no particular order, uh, starting with Coro Mining, which we had a webinar on uh, a little while ago. I mean, we feel this is a really undervalued copper oxide project in the Tier 1 jurisdiction of Chile. There are very, very few SXCW copper oxide opportunities, and uh, even fewer in a good jurisdiction such as, uh, such as Chile. And we think that the, the company still has a ton of exploration upside, but has a, a short path and a low CapEx hurdle to get into production there. Another one of our top picks in the base metals is Rockcliffe Metals. Uh, this is a VMS explorer in the Snow Lake camp. Uh, they're expecting to have three PEAs by mid-year, uh, plus 70,000 meters of drilling this year. Uh, as part of their fully funded uh, drill program. Uh, number three, Soul Gold, uh, pretty, pretty well-known stock. Um, we're bullish on this one, especially this year because the stock's been down and they have a new, they have a pre-feasibility study coming out, which we think is gonna show much improved economics, uh, especially because of the new recoveries they demonstrated, which haven't been factored in uh, as of yet. And we, we view this one as a definite potential takeout candidate. Uh, and we'd note that uh, 
BHP's hold or standstill uh, ends in August, is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, October. October. So um, post that, things could get exciting, especially if the sole world share price hasn't recovered much from where it is. Uh, Atico Mining is a small but high-grade and very profitable copper producer. Um, was topical in the last, second half of last year because they acquired Talachi, uh, which is an Ecuadorian deposit that's very, very precious metals rich uh, and, and very high-grade in general. So now they have a, a growth project there. So we think that that's a, a really good place to be. And, uh, you know, they're generating good free cash flow. Uh, finally, Adventist Mining is uh, one of the best VMS development opportunities uh, in a good jurisdiction. Um, this is in Ecuador, and it's a very, very high-grade VMS opportunity. Um, unlike most VMSs, this is an open pit project with a lot of precious metals, not a huge amount of capex, and a very strong shareholder base and management team to, to move it forward. Uh, next slide there, Josh. Um, <clears throat> so next is uh, is uranium, and, and and the theme is that 2020 is here, and we talked a little bit about in, at the beginning about why we think 2020 is the year. Um, the fundamentals really do suggest the price is going to go up. There's uh, one producer in the world that actually makes money at the current at the current spot price, um, and demand continues to grow. Uh, part of a lot of uh, the climate change initiatives in the developing world is actually building new new, new reactors. Um, and so we're seeing demand increase. Additionally, additionally, uh, obviously, and with that increasing demand, we don't have any new supply coming on because of the current price. So the price has to move to get there. Um, the other thing, and, and why we, the other reason we think market 2020 could be the year and why this could push higher is that market activity seems to be picking up. Uh, in sort of uh, the end of last year, the first three weeks of November, we saw almost 7.6 million pounds uh, get transacted in the spot market. Put that in perspective, that's about seven or eight percent of uh, sort of global demand. So, uh, or sorry, global supply. So that's uh, significant. Um, and then additionally as well, we saw some big long-term contracts signed, uh, including some U.S. ones, which is not something we'd seen. The, the, the 232 decision had held up uh, and the, then the nuclear fuel working group had held up some of these U.S. utilities from, from getting into setting up long-term agreements. Uh, obviously, that start, looks like it started to change the end of uh, the end of 2019. And those long-term agreements are the key to the price price moving higher and going back into, in line with the fundamentals of the producers. The other key thing in uranium here, and this is, a, this is an, interesting, an interesting part of it, um, high risk isn't too risky for potential acquirers. Um, the, the two biggest builders of reactors in the developing world aren't uh, first world con uh, countries. Or they're, they're the state controlled companies of, of China and Russia uh, that are building these reactors. And what they're doing as they sell the reactors, they're selling long-term supply agreements with those reactors. Um, now, Russia does have some uranium production, but China has very little. Um, and so both of both of these groups are going to have to acquire uh, uranium production for the long term. And so uh, it probably importantly, uh, and neither of those groups are afraid of going into sort of what we as investors might view as higher risk jurisdictions. And so um, look for them to be active in Africa. We've already seen the Chinese active in, uh, in Namibia uh, acquiring producing mines. Um, so we expect that to uh, continue. So as such, our top picks in the uranium space are, first of all, is fission. Obviously, share price has been under pressure with tax loss selling at the end of last year, but it's a low cost, low risk pounds in a tier one jurisdiction, the kind of thing that U.S. utilities want to contract for over the long term. So um, that looks, uh, you know, it, it's attractive from that perspective. And the second is Goviex. And, and, and Goviex has some of the few ready to build pounds, uh, but they are in, you know, Niger, uh, Zambia and Mali. And so, but as, as we said, we don't think that those, that's a place where the lar world's largest buyers are willing to go. Um, and as they try to secure long-term supply, uh, they're looking for pounds that'll be ready for the for the next cycle. Then on to uh, rare earths and battery metals. Yeah, we'll just uh, go over this quickly. I'll uh, remind everybody watching that uh, we're almost ready to, to start taking your, your questions. So uh, you can go ahead and start typing those in and then uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can with the time allotted. So just quickly on rare earths, uh, they've been staging a bit of a comeback. What I alluded to earlier with the US Army is that they have offered to fund up to two thirds of US based pilot plant refinery capex for heavy rare earth uh, processing. 
Uh, and this is the first market incentive they've offered uh, since the Manhattan Project in the Second World War. Uh, and this is a nice start, but I think the commentary from most North American explorers and potential developers was that they expected more. And I think that that's true. You'll probably see more incentive coming from uh, the United States in this regard and potentially uh, Australia, where there are a lot of rare earth uh, opportunities and, and even in Canada. Um, as far as the, the 800 pound gorilla room, which is China, as far as rare earth supply goes, they did announce last year that they were increasing their rare earth mining quota by 10% above the record amount they produced in 2018. Uh, we feel this is really just a response to the, the trade war situation. Um, China has in the past uh, used their massive supply to, to manage rare earth prices, to maintain their market share. And uh, we expect to see uh, that kind of similar thing happen again. Uh, but I think if they try it too much, um, the United States might form a strategic stockpile and, and just try to soak up a lot of that supply. So as far as better metals, um, they're kind of got ahead of themselves on the EV revolution. Uh, they had a fantastic start. Uh, they've come off uh, more recently, um, but there will be deficits in the longer term for certain. Um, we expect, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, nickel and cobalt, uh, more particularly nickel, to have very, very strong fundamentals going, going forward. And in general, you know, we're looking for companies there that have a path to production uh, versus just kind of general commodity plays. Um, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats, but the, the better quality things with an actual chance to produce so will do better. Uh, so we have one pick in this arena is uh, Standard Lithium, uh, which has a partner in developing um, extraction technology from brine uh, to produce lithium. And at the moment, they're scaling it up. And we feel like once they demonstrate that the process will work at a larger scale, this is going to get uh, a lot of attention and investment. And then our, our next slide talks about a piece that we, we published this morning. And it's Red Cloud's Endangered Species List. Um, and basically, these are our stocks that, uh, you know, Jake and I are using our experience and, and what we know is going on in the market that we think have the potential to be taken out in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, there's 11 names on the list. We we published sort of the inaugural list, and um, we'll update it from time to time as as, as things change. Um, but uh, what I what I am going to do for the sake of time, and so we can get to questions, uh, we'll just list. You know, you could read the names at your uh, at your leisure, um, and, uh, and and go through that piece that's online. The other thing I would say about our research, and and, uh, and, and Josh will put it up on in the chat. Um, our uh, our research is free and open to everybody. I uh, just need to log in uh, and, and create, create a login and you can get a look at it. So you can look about any of these names that we talked about in our top picks or anything wider in our, our overall coverage list um, to, uh, to at your leisure. So with that, uh, I think we'll turn it over to, uh, to questions. Uh, Josh, if you can uh, flip that up for us. There we go. Uh, and... Which, uh, Josh, just remind me, which order they come in? Is the bottom first or is the top first? Bottom first. Bottom first. And is this the, the is uh, that question the bottom one? Yes. Sir. Okay. okay. We'll start there. Uh, so we got a question from uh, on uh, on North Star Gold. Uh, it's a project, uh, I believe, just to the the north or the south of uh, of Macassa. Um, I've, uh, I've looked at it briefly. I don't really have uh, anything to say to, to comment on it on, on this forum, uh, unless you have, uh, Jake. No, not really familiar with it. So, uh, we'll have to, uh, to look at that for next time. Okay. With respect to, uh, with respect to, so one of the questions is, uh, do you view coral as a takeout target? Obviously it's on our endangered species list. Maybe Jake talk about a little bit what makes coral unique as a takeout target. Sure. Uh, I, I think Coro is uh, extremely well situated. Um, it's within 15 minutes of a deep water port in Chile where most of the sulfuric acid comes in, which is going to be one of their, their major consumables. Uh, there's already a water pipeline onto the property 
Uh, as most of you know, water is always a, a key thing for uh, Chilean projects. There is a, a small but usable SXCW plant already on the property. That was from a former producing mine. Uh, it probably would cost somewhere between 20 and 30 million to retrofit the plant and get it ready to produce again. Um, so, you know, especially in a company country like Chile, there's probably good opportunity to get some debt financing. Um, so there, there could be very little equity involved in financing this. Um, so they're, they're hoping to have a feasibility study out, a revised feasibility study out around mid year. Um, and depending on how discussions go in, in, you know, debt talks, they could start producing, you know, um, in, in the, in the very near term. Um, and when you're a, a, a cathode producer, instead of a, a concentrate producer, you, you have much more control over your margins. Um, you know, when you deal with a smelter, you got to have smelter contracts. They take metal away from you, you know, and then there's an issue of recoveries. You've got to market the concentrate. You've got to worry about impurities, all kinds of other things. Um, and then there's there's opportunity to expand upon that, that plant for, for a long time. Um, you know, they have close to a billion pounds of, of copper oxide in one pit right on surface and uh, as luck would have it some of the highest grade stuff is right on surface so when they start mining there um, they could start processing one percent copper material um, i can't remember anybody losing money processing one percent copper oxide material um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we we think that this is an excellent opportunity for uh, somebody who wants near term copper oxide production in, in a great jurisdiction and still a lot of exploration upside which is always a, a key part of every acquisition right there's 300 square kilometers there uh, and they've basically explored maybe 10 percent of that thoroughly um, and of course there's still an opportunity for a deeper sulfide resource uh, which has not really been outlined yet but we certainly think is there somewhere um, and um, that's uh, something that would keep potential acquirers very interested. So, continue to work down the questions. Um, as far as someone asked if the slide presentation is accessible, I believe it's uh, posted in the webinar, and we'll make it when we send out the replay of the webinar. We'll uh, we'll put up the link for it as well, so you could have it. And it's actually we only talked about the first uh, eleven slides of that uh, of that presentation. It's actually a fifty-four page presentation, going into some of the details on the commodities and on uh, sort of our top picks. Um, Next question is on the the price of gold. You know, have we seen the best price for the year? I don't think so. Um, I you know we use for our valuation purposes we use fifteen hundred dollar gold. We try and use something co close to spot. Um, I think sixteen hundred obviously is within sight here at this at the moment. Um, and I don't think uh, that two thousand is out of the realm of possibility for this year. Um, now, and I don't think that's a that's a, a ridiculous number to think about as as being possible. So that is a. Uh, uh, definitely something to uh, to look forward to, and why we're bullish and why we're bullish on gold. Looking uh, at uh, uh, continuing on with the questions, um, question about Seabridge and, and the JV and when that announcement could happen. Um, I guess there's there, there, there's sort of two things with the the Seabridge JV. Um, our understanding is that I mean it, it could happen at any time. Uh, I know that uh, there are a number of parties that are are, are speaking to uh, to Seabridge on the, on that very subject, and there are only probably just over a handful of parties that can actually build that project. And so there are, the, you know, uh, Rudy's having the conversation with the right people. Um, as far as what I what we think, uh, we think it's probably a this year uh, type event, uh, probably on the outside next year. Uh, you have to remember the company's permits are good till twenty twenty four. Um, and so they have to show substantial progress before those permits are uh, before that before that end date, um, which could include a feasibility study by a major would be a, a substantial progress. And so I think that's an important factor uh, in in the timing. And, and, and we're getting you know as that starts to wind down, that becomes more and more important. Um, next question uh, is for you, Jake, with respect to Wallbridge. Um, what kind of resource estimate do you foresee, um, and, and from all their drilling be, being done? Uh, it's a uh, good question. It's a little bit difficult to answer. I, I think uh, to take a step back, it's important for people to understand there, there's really three different kinds of um, that we we see at, at uh, Fenelon. And the first is the the obvious uh, near near Earth surface underground 
uh, main GABRO, uh, very high grade mineralization. This is where the, the test mining was done previously. Uh, the bulk sample will came out and uh, graded higher than expectations, uh, which happens sometimes, um, and uh, graded about 18 grams a ton. That is being drilled off right now from underground by, by one drill rig. Um, then, of course, there's the newer discovery, deeper high grade zones, uh, such as the uh, Cayenne and, and Tabasco. Uh, these are the, the zones that produce the, the really spectacular graves that lit a fire under the stock. And more recently, they've been stepping away, uh, doing step out drilling from those and still hitting really, really strong mineralization. And then there are several rigs that are drilling from surface, just stepping out into the uh, Jeremy Pluton and some of these other newer areas, the Orion Corridor. And they keep hitting mineralization. And this is sort of more of an open pit kind of mineralization where it's one, one and a half grams right from surface for you know 100 meters or more. So uh, it's possible the company might end up doing three sort of separate resource estimates where you have the, the main Gabbro one, the very high grade, uh, deeper Tabasco and um, Cayenne zones, and then a, a broad, uh, from surface resource um, and the, the collection of those three is, is really interesting because it, it kind of gives you almost like three different gold mines in one place. Um, so I still think that um, there's going to be some really excellent results that are going to come out of there. A lot of drilling to be done. Um, so we're, we're very excited about that. And uh... And that's 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 interesting. And the next up, the next next questions are about uh, RNC. So uh, first is about um, you know what makes us believe that the turnaround has happened at RNC. I think you just you know you have to look as far back as uh, I guess Tuesday of last week when they put out their their Q4 production results. Did north of twenty six thousand ounces of, of production added twelve million dollars in cash to the balance sheet. Um, that means they had a very profitable quarter. Um, yeah, twenty two hundred dollar Aussie gold. Everyone should have a profitable quarter. But they had a very profitable quarter, and that that for me is the, is the clear sign of, that the turnaround is, is is well in well in full swing. Um, second question on RNC uh, from another from another viewer was about uh, when the you know when you think what's the milestone for a takeover. And I think there's there's two two milestones. Obviously, you have a lot of the Aussie producers have generated a lot of cash, and so they are looking to deploy that cash. But I think you have to prove that that beta hunt is a viable asset. So I think. The first milestone is continuing to deliver quality production results, um, which we've seen now. You know, we had 24,000 ounces in Q3, 26,000 ounces in Q4. We're expecting another quarter over quarter in Q1. So that's going to push the needle along for these guys to potentially buy. And the second is the high is the high what we are calling the high grade contact zone. Um, so with the high grade contact zone is is this area where the coarse gold has been coming from. But I don't. I don't think it's more coarse gold finds that are necessarily going to move the needle for someone to, to, to jump in and buy, uh, even at one of the other shear zones like A-Zone, as, as suggested. I think what is going to happen is that demonstrating that this contact zone is actually much higher grade. Um, and so if you look at the, the contact zone on Western Flakes around uh, the Father's Day vein, the coarse gold that's come out of there, that zone grades 5.3 grams a ton. Now, you have to remember the reserve grade at Beta Hunt is only 2.8. Um, that's assuming they don't find another ounce. They're going to be stoping that that area um, in uh, in Q in Q4 and Q1, and with that stoping work, we're going to get an idea of how how, how much higher grade the zone could be. Um, and I think that might be the trigger that that pushes somebody over the edge. Um, you know, if, if they hit the residual grade in the remaining material, uh, that zone is going to grade close to eight, eight grams a ton, uh, which is uh, very very profitable when, when you consider that you're, um, you're you're trucking to surface on very wide zones. So. Uh, I think that's something to to keep an eye out for, and might be something that pushes people over the edge. The other thing on a, a takeout of RNC, and I guess this is the, this is the other side of that that argument, is that Beta Hunt has been for sale half a dozen times in the last uh, three years. Um, so a lot of the Australian producers are very familiar with it, but Beta Hunt's never been down at this depth before into that uh, into that con this what we're calling the high grade contact zone where the where the where the uh, the shear zones hit the peritic sediment. So uh, it should be interesting to watch. It is certainly something to uh, to keep an eye on. Um, next question, uh, back to Wallbridge, a hot, a hot topic, I guess. Uh, with regard to Wallbridge, uh, do you see KL as, as, as the main company to acquire it, given that they now own 10%? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I think they're definitely the leading candidate. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting about uh, the Kirkland Lake takeover of, of Detour is that it's not that far from Walridge. It's sort of 80 kilometers in a straight line. Uh, it'd be well over that in a trucking distance, more probably on the order of 125 or 150 kilometers. But if you're talking about the the main gabbro mineralization that we know, you know, when it was test mine graded 18 grams a ton, that kind of material can be trucked uh, very easily. Uh, certainly that distance is, is not prohibitive at all. And if you wanted to, you could potentially, we feel, truck some main gabbro zone ore over to, to detour and uh, a small increase in grade at detour makes a very big difference in the economics of their deposit. This, of course, is assuming that the, the takeover of, of detour by Kirkland Lake goes through. Uh, but, um, you know, we think that this is something that, that Kirkland Lake may have been uh, also contemplating uh, for the future. Um, and that, yeah, now that they have 10%, it certainly is, is um, most likely that if, if the company were to disappear this year, that it, it would be them. But I still think that uh, there is uh, unlimited, really strong exploration upside at Wallbridge, and it could attract uh, several other people. And, uh, you know, you could end up seeing a, a competitive situation there. Yeah, I guess with uh, with those kind of grades and that, that kind of scale potential, there's, everyone's interested in it. You don't necessarily need to truck it to Detour to, to make it work, right? No, I certainly don't. But uh, there's a long history of Canadian high-grade gold deposits getting acquired by the majors. They don't usually get developed by juniors. Yeah. Um, next question, I'm going to give this one to you. But, uh, you know, looking at... Uh, Sort of, uh, sort of the higher risk as as gold is starting to run, uh, higher risk countries in, in Guinea and West Africa. Um, what are, what are our, your sort of your thoughts there uh, with respect to taking on that higher risk? Well, uh, it's a good point. I mean, as gold goes higher, um, people's risk tolerance tends to uh, to increase as well. Um, you know, the the West African gold opportunities are usually. Uh, uh, attractive because they're very high grade and uh, they can be brought into production uh, uh, more quickly. Um, however, it, as you know, you all are probably very aware, there's been some serious uh, issues with uh, safety uh, in some of those West African countries. So um, there, there could be a slower return to investing there um, for foreign companies, uh, for companies that are not there now. Obviously, the, the companies that are there now are, are more likely to, to continue to invest there. And they may even see an absence of other companies there as an opportunity that, for them to leverage their, their in-region opportunities and, and skills there. Um, we at Red Cloud tend to focus much more in, in the uh, safest jurisdictions, uh, um, that um, uh, allow for uh, investor confidence and, um, and and safety of your your employees and security of the asset. Uh, the one thing I, I would add with respect to that, though, is that we're still early, probably in, in a gold cycle. We're very early, very early innings, um, and so at this moment, the focus is commodity risk. And so, when you have higher commodity risk, you, people are willing less less willing to take political risk or security risk and things like that. As you get further in the gold cycle, I think is what we saw the last time around. Um, those you're taking less commodity risk because obviously gold's running, and you're taking you know you're willing to take more political or geopolitical risk, and that tends to happen. What tends to happen in the cycle is that those uh, those higher risk jurisdictions become more in favor uh, later uh, in the cycle um, because they they tend to move second. Um, the next. Uh, next question um, is with respect to uh, junior explorers and when you think M and A helps um, helps that part of the sector, uh, and that's that's a fair point. Um, so looking at looking at uh, looking at junior explorers and, and how that how that's gone, um, obviously one of our key points on the themes is that the drill bit continues to be the, the biggest creator of value, and you know, so uh, junior explorers that are having success are going to 
outperform, obviously. Um, but with respect to just lifting valuations in general in that, that end of the sector on the M&A side, uh, we've seen the M&A focused on production. Uh, obviously, the, the detour transaction, which we just briefly talked about, was in production. Uh, Santa Barbara taking out uh, Atlantic was production. Um, the acquisition uh, of Red Lake was guys chasing production assets. Um, and so that is uh, that has been the that has been the focus. But as we get as as fewer of those assets are available out there and they start and the space starts to consolidate, all of a sudden you, you start to move down to cap. And I think we're getting close to the point where companies can start looking down cap at development stage assets, particularly the majors. Both majors committed, uh, both Newmont and Barrick uh, post their mergers uh, committed to divesting a substantial amount of assets, and most of them are a long way down that path. Uh, both have, have done north of a billion dollars uh, in divestitures already. And so they're starting to line up and be ready to go uh, start acquiring things. Um, so I think that's a, that is an interesting, uh, uh, that is interesting. And I think they're, they're going to lead the charge when they go and acquire something and that will move everything. The other thing is, though, is that stepping back from the majors and looking sort of that next level down at sort of those mid-tier producers, a lot of them are in good financial shape, especially those, those as I mentioned, those in Australia. And so um, they are at a point where they could support development projects or build and builds, um, especially with a, a firm goal price. So I, I think it's soon that we start to see developers and, and juniors uh, uh, um, get some love on the M&A side. And then obviously that will raise, uh, raise the profile. Uh, next question is, what do you think about Novo Resources? Um, Novo is something, uh, for those of you who have tuned in before, it's something we've talked about a lot. Um, we were one of the first, first groups uh, to, to look at that story. Um, I think uh, with respect to Novo, there's sort of, um, Novo has been advancing sort of three projects uh, relatively aggressively. Um, I think probably the most news, or newsy has been Edgina, uh, which is a, a gravel lag deposit, not something your people are typically used to in the, in the public mining space. But uh, they've had some reasonably good success. And, you know, it's going to be tough for them to put a resource out on it. But as they continue to, to have success, people will start to believe in, in that potential. Um, and remember that they're not actually funding the, the, the exploration and development work there. It's uh, Sumitomo that's putting the bill for 30, the first $30 million. So I think that's, uh, that's important. They're not taking that high risk, uh, that, that, that sort of difficult exploration on their balance sheet. Uh, with respect to Beaton's Creek, which is the original reason we got involved in the story, um, that project, they've, they've advanced it. They've, they've done a, an updated resource last year. Um, and, that, you know, they're looking to, to move things ahead there. Um, and right now, what we're, what we're really looking for is a path on the processing side, whether they, they, they go it alone uh, with their uh, using their uh, permitted blue spec site as a place for the mill, uh, or whether they partner with one of the other groups in the area to, to, to build something larger. So I think that's, that could be a, a significant near-term catalyst if, if that comes to pass, because uh, obviously they'll, they'll transition to a producer. With respect to Karatha, which sort of got the the uh, the Pará Gold uh, craze started, um, that you know the next step there is actually trial mining um, and, and increasing the sample size again, effectively. And uh, right now, the company's been working on getting its uh, its permits to do that. It's obviously not a, a short process, and uh, the local Aboriginal uh, corporation there that they deal with has gone through a, a couple of leadership changes recently, and so it's made that process it's extended that process. So. Uh, you know, I think once they have those permits and they, they're out there uh, sort of mining, uh, I think we'll get an idea of, of what the potential of those systems are. I think in general, though, the Pilbara Gold space is, is on hold until we see that next that next scale of, uh, um, of bulk sample uh, taken and people can see what the sort of what the potential is. Um, lastly, I guess the last question I have on my screen and might be the, barring another one coming up here. We'll, uh, we'll probably call it after this one. Um, what do you think of West Red Lake Gold? Um, uh, I have looked up, taken a very brief look at it. It's got a, a good address, uh, obviously, but uh, I haven't looked at it in any detail. Have you, uh, Jake? I, I did have a chance to have a call with management there, um, and uh, they, they had some interesting assets. Uh, it, I was very encouraged with the, the sale at Red Lake that – some of these sort of satellite-ish Red Lake explorers uh, might get some 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 love and and uh, find some more opportunity for funding. Uh, they were doing a small drill program. I haven't seen too much as far as results out of them, uh, but I think that uh, it's an interesting story that we're we're keeping a close eye. All right. Well. 
uh, that's it for questions. And I think that's a good, is a good spot to call it. So thank you everybody for uh, attending today. Thanks to uh, Josh for uh, uh, being the wizard behind the, uh, w the wizard behind the computer screen. Um, as a reminder, uh, any of these companies that we've talked about, uh, you're, you can uh, read about our research for free uh, just by logging into our website. Uh, Josh is going to put up uh, uh, all of the, uh, put up the link to that. And all you do is put in your email address and sign up and you're free to access anything that we've ever written. Um, the other thing is, is that our next webinar is going to be the first sort of, this is our first webinar, our weekly webinar, but uh, we're going to have every week a Thursday at two o'clock. We'll have a webinar, and our first one this week is going to be uh, talking to the management of uh, Silver Viper, uh, a company that, uh, that that we like. So, uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.